My name is John Jones, uh, and as Julie was mentioning, I am researching early Swedish settlers. But coming a little bit afterwards, uh, the Danes arrived too, and they married Swedes at times. And so the the connection between the two communities is uh, is direct from the very beginning. And so because of my research, I've gathered some information about the first Danes who were here. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about just the very first few who arrived in the area before the Civil War. Uh, the research that I have is posted on my uh, website, jamestownsweets.org, and so I'll make a copy of uh, these slides and post that on that uh, website so that you can see that later on. Um, so here's just a brief overview of Danish history here in Jamestown. Um, they were actually here early in Western New York's history because like the Swedes, they arrived as sailors or captains or shipwrights. Um, and, uh, but the first notable one is a Dane who actually ran a hotel in the port of Buffalo. So where the Erie Canal ended and where the port was, there was a Dane named Peter Lawson. And some of the very first Swedes gained uh, uh, gained uh, employment at that hotel. So in different censuses, he shows up as having Swedish employees. In the 1850 census here in Chautauqua County and also in Warren County, there are no Danes that are listed. And in the 1855 New York census, uh, there's an indication that there are five Danes living in the county. Uh, there are very few local histories about Danes. The Danes were a relatively important community in Jamestown based on their numbers. There were only about 300 here listed in the 1900 census, but they did very well in Jamestown and in Warren, specifically in those two cities. And as a result, they were very well known within the culture of the area. Uh, the local histories that are, have been written indicate that the first Dane who arrived in Jamestown was Marcus Peterson, who was a blacksmith, and that he arrived in 1854. But uh, unfortunately, it's a confused history because uh, in his census reports, he reports 1856, and he seems to show up in an 1855 Danish census. So it doesn't seem that he arrived at that point. Um, the, other thing that's curious about our local history is that we don't make it much of a big deal that one of the guests of the Danish community here was Jacob Rees when he came in 1870. Uh, Jacob Rees is one of the most uh, noteworthy Danish Americans. He's very highly, he's very important in Denmark. And uh, if you're studying the time of the turn of the century and the progressive movement and Theodore Roosevelt, he's very important during that period as well. He spent a winter and part of the spring here at Jamestown, and then he moved to Westfield and was doing odd jobs there for a doctor, and then moved on to Buffalo. And you'll see this as a common theme amongst these early Danes. He's not an early Dane, he's arriving in 1870, but many of the emigrants from Denmark were just single men. And so they were footloose and fancy free in some way. Um, finally, the other general note about our histories is that uh, the role of women is not written about <laughs> any importance, any significance. Uh, so the most uh, incredible omission for me is that um, Jacob Reese stayed in the household of. Uh, the Romer uh, brothers, Nicholas Romer. Well, Nicholas Romer's wife was Swedish. Uh, she's not mentioned in the book. She's not given any credit. There was a woman taking care of uh, a houseload of Swedes coming in and out of her house, I'm sure, for a decade, and no mention of her role and, and, and importance. He did say that he messed up her kitchen. I mean, her, his autobiography is, is interesting in that part. Um, the other thing that's not mentioned is that the very first born Homer. Uh, and I'll get to that, to come to the U.S. was probably Carolyn Beck, but because she's a woman and she's married to a, a Dane, she perhaps doesn't count. Anyway, she's not written about this. We're trying to get that corrected today. 
So the 1855 census, I told you that there were four or five uh, Danes listed in our area, but uh, Jacobson isn't one of them. The family, it seems, that account for that statistic uh, was uh, uh, Carl Zimmerman, who was living outside of Fredonia. So they are listed in 1855. They had arrived just in 1854, the year before. Um, on the uh, manifest for that ship, they indicate that their origin was Holstein. And so there's a section in Denmark on the Jutland Peninsula, which is uh, the Jutland Peninsula, then Schleswig, then Holstein, and then the other southern part of Germany. And so uh, it's unclear, and I have not determined yet, have not found yet, where they were from in this area, where their origins were. Um, that makes, also because there were two wars and the border moved up and down, it's also complicated to identify yourself in this area. The map at the right shows the language groups that were prevalent in mid-century, mid-19th century. The pink is showing the Danish, the blue is showing the German, and the yellow is showing the Free Slander. So Free Slander is the Free Slander people, um, and they are from, uh, sort of in the area from about uh, Riva in, in Denmark, uh, and Tolnar and all that, going all the way south to Groningen in the Netherlands. So it's a, a, a people with a separate language, I think it's the language on the continent most close to English, that are living along uh, the border of the sea. Um, so to say that they were the first Swedes in our, or first Swedes, pardon me, the first Danes in our area is complicated. I'm not sure whether he was Danish, whether she was Danish, what language they spoke, I can't tell. What I do know now, and looking at their death certificates, she reported that he had been born in Denmark, and she reported that he, that she herself had been born in Denmark. So they considered themselves Danish. They may have been German speaking Danish, but she can speak the same. So they are the earliest Danes that I have been able to track who lived in this town, despite what Christy said. Uh, the story gets even more confusing because they're not really talked about in our history. But this man studied with one of the greatest violinists of the 19th century. Uh, the man he studied with was uh, had was a colleague of Beethoven, and this man had not only been uh, fought in the Danish Revolution in the, the first Schleswig War, but he had also been a Civil War veteran a musician in the 111th Pennsylvania Regiment. And he was a pretty noteworthy uh, musician in our area. So there's none of that in Danish histories, our local Danish histories. And it's an omission that seems quite incorrect, even if it's fake spoke German. It's an omission in our histories that's quite incorrect. He's probably one of the most talented men and talented musicians that have been in Chicago County. Oh, well, so much for history. Um, so instead of uh, this area of Holstein, we'll, we'll move out of, uh, because there were two wars, there was a lot of migration from uh, both Holstein and from Schleswig to America, but those people did not uh, show up in Jamestown. Instead, most of the Danes in Jamestown actually were from one single island in the Baltic, about 200 miles to the east. So that island is Bornholm. Uh, geographically, it's closer to Sweden than it is to uh, Copenhagen. Um, it's shown in the red on, on this map. And if you'll notice, uh, so here's Bornholm. Uh, down here is Gdansk. Here's uh, Lübeck and stuff over here. This is Ustad. This is probably the closest point to it, the southern coast to Sweden. And over here is Copenhagen. So it's, it's really quite quite a distance. So it's, much closer, but it is a Danish uh, history that they have. Um, this has been a Danish, it wasn't a Swedish pro uh, island that then became Danish. No, this has been a Danish island for a long, long time. Uh, it's uh, Now, Bornholm is well known for its beaches and great summer weather. One of the most de 
disappointing uh, stories when you're in Denmark are people who have spent their summers and uh, Danes love, they have a nice long summer vacation and then they have to book a long time ahead and they, they go somewhere and it rains the whole time. It's a very typical Danish experience. <laughs> uh, uh, instead, the island of Bornholm has a, a very different climate. It is very well known for its summer sun and it's a very popular artist community. They have not nice uh, artist galleries there. Um, they also have some uh, churches and they have their own distinct uh, local dialect. You can imagine that because they're so far out in the, uh, in the Baltic and removed. So, in talking about the local history, this is one that was written in 1927 for Jamestown's centennial. And so they had each ethnic group write a history of how they ended up being in Jamestown. And here they recount that Marcus Jacobson, uh, Jacobson had been the first one to come in 1854. I'm not sure about the date. He was very successful. We'll talk to him about that. And then later on, it talks about the fact that later uh, Charles Beck arrived. Both of those will be talked about. So that's the, the Jamestown history. It's the Danes in Jamestown saw it in 1927. But there's another nice history that adds more detail, and that actually comes from the obituary of Nelson Greenland, who was uh, lived in Warren. And he notes that he left in 1857 from Bornholm, and uh, how he got here. And he remembers that when he got to Buffalo, he met five other Danes, um, C. C. Beck, so that's Charles Beck, J. Mortensen, Hans Anker, uh, Lawrence Tiedemann, and A. C. Holmes, and then when he got to Jamestown, then uh, that's when he met Marco Jacobs. So that gives us a list of who was in the area at the time from this man's experience. So this is the list again. And uh, as I recounted earlier, these were ten; these were single men uh, traveling. The exception is that, but I'll, we'll get to him. And so they married a whole series. They married Americans. They married. Germans, they married Swedes. So the, 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 James, the Jamestown Danes became assimilated into different communities. Uh, and they were very uh, proudly Danish. That, that's clear in, in much of what I've read, and they spent a lot of effort to promote that. But it was still a small community in Jamestown. So Marcus Jacobson, uh, if you talk to a Dane, and uh, for example, the beginning of Lego industries or, or anything like that, the difficulties of the apprenticeship system was almost overwhelming, but it marked Danish craftsmen and uh, continues to mark Danish craftsmen. Previously for how onerous it was, how difficult it was, uh, and then um, more recently at how proud they are of the crafts were. Uh, so Jacobson had apprenticed as a blacksmith. He arrived in Jamestown at a time when Jamestown was exploding uh, in edge tools and other work. He got into the uh, carriage industry, became a partner, eventually developed pat uh, inventions that were patented. Uh, he really became rapidly assimilated into the Jamestown business community. He started uh, in real estate. Uh, and there's even an indication, which I thought was really interesting, from 1904, and they're talking about the, the fire, which the fire comes, the volunteer fire companies in Jamestown, that uh, Jacobson had joined the fire department as a, as a volunteer in 1857. So he very quickly entered into Jamestown uh, community. He also entered into the Swedish community because his wife was Swedish, and his wife's family was a founding member of the Swedish Methodist Church. Possibly for that connection, most of the early uh, Danes in Jamestown ended up being Methodists. He married uh, Sophia Larsdotter, and uh, so these are the uh, the families connection for uh, for that family. Uh, Anna Lonsdotter came. Uh, with her children uh, that are listed there. After her husband died, she arrived in Jamestown. Then her husband's brother arrived later and they eventually married. So uh, she married twice 
she married two brothers. Um, and so that's that family connection. And as a result of that, two of Anna Kaisha Jones' daughters, uh, daughters married Danes. So there's a close connection there and likely a very close connection for uh, the Methodist community. Uh, now I want to switch attention, though, to Carl Christian Beck. And as far as how I see the history happening, the reason that there are any Danes in Jamestown who, or who would have arrived in Jamestown was because of this man. Okay, so the, he, does, he arrives in Jamestown. He lived in Jamestown starting from 1864. But previously, he was working. He had come to America, and he worked in Buffalo. You want to almost credit him as being a Swede. He was born in Sweden. He was born in Karlsham, one of the southern uh, uh, ports. Uh, and he was born there because his father was a master shipbuilder. He was a Danish uh, master shipbuilder who was then hired and, and moved to Karlsham. And there he married the widow of a Danish captain, uh, Dorothy Wink. Oh, I'm sorry, Abel Benedict Lynch, sorry. Um, it's confusing whether he was fully divorced or not. They're, they're, the only manner to be divorced during this time period was, there were several manners, sorry. The easiest manner was to move to another country. <laughs> and so since Denmark and Sweden are so close together, making that jump made it convenient for getting a divorce. So it may be that one of the reasons he moved to Karl Scham was to be able to do that. Much of that history I, I, I haven't learned. It's curious, that's all I can say. Uh, so this is the listing over at the right of Carl, uh, their first son, uh, Carl Christian uh, uh, Beck, and uh, his birth record in Karl Scham. So that's showing where Karl Scham is, and then down there with uh, Bornholm. Yeah. Uh, Niels Beck, so the father died tragically at age 43. So then his wife, along with her children, moved to Rena, uh, in which is the largest village on the island of Bornholm. And they did that in 1853. I'm sorry, 1833, when uh, Carl was seven years old. So he grew up his whole life there. He was confirmed in Rena. Uh, he was in the same confirmation class as his wife. Uh, I don't know whether they had separated it at that time. Very often, uh, the girls and boys were uh, attended different classes. And he emigrated to America at least before 1848. In 1848, he shows up in records in Buffalo. Uh, 1852, uh, Carolyn emigrates from, she had been working in Copenhagen. She emigrates, and they get married. And then 1864, they moved to Jamestown. So this is a rundown of some of Carolyn's, Carolyn Beck's, uh, Carolyn Rona's uh, history. Uh, she was born in Rona from uh, Danish parents. She's very, very much a born homer. She, at age 21, moved to Copenhagen. Uh, and then she emigrated at the same time as her mother-in-law. But uh, in her obituary, strangely enough, it indicates that it very clearly it points that she moved to America and then met Charles Beck and then were married. as so though were an independent thing. It, it seems more likely that they had arranged this ahead of time and that they knew each other uh, ahead of time. Um, so what is also interesting about that is that her mother-in-law, April, is one of the oldest Scandinavians who ever lived in Jamestown. She, she was born in 1792, I think, and died here in Jamestown and is buried in Lakeview Cemetery. Um, Beck was very successful in, in Buffalo. He was a ship's builder, he was a ship's carpenter. It was a very heady time for business on, on the lakes at that time. And evidently, he was a good Dane and he was also able to make a fast uh, sailing boat. And so he was a founding member of the Buffalo Yacht Club, and he is ships one, uh, the first couple of uh, regattas, and one of the ships that he won evidently won years and years afterwards. He had sold it to somebody else, 
but one of the ships that he had built, the Adele, uh, continued to win and win and win in the larger division. Um, in Jamestown, he then moved to what is at the end of what used to be the end of Third Street uh, at the boat landing. And so this is an 1867 map of Jamestown, and this shows the location of Beck's house, and then the location of his ice house. Um, his shipyards would probably share the same building, and then were also outside. Strangely enough, here's one of his ships. There's an indication it's an 18-footer. I'm not quite sure, or a 19-footer. I'm not sure that that's the case, but one of the publications that is list that's in the Chautauqua, uh, the collection of the uh, Chautauqua County Historical Society has a picture of the boat showing you some of the look of that. Um, that interest in sailing helped him in Chautauqua because his because his boats won and because doing regattas on Chautauqua Lake and Chautauqua Institution and that sort of summer thing. All the cup that had become a rage in our area, he developed a large amount of business either building new boats, new fast boats, or taking older boats and making them faster. Um, he also built steamboats. Uh, so there are two steamboats the William Phillips and the PJ Honor that I know he's credited as. I don't know what other ships he had worked on. Uh, Another indication that he also, beyond that detail, that he, he both sailed six, uh, competitively and uh, built uh, ships on Chautauqua Lake, uh, he also seems to be the pioneer investor in ice houses in the ice industry in Jamestown. And so this is surprising because it, it suggests that he had done amazingly well in, in Buffalo. If he had arrived in Buffalo, he built the, uh, the ice house immediately. And this description of what the damage from the flood in uh, the spring of 1865 indicates he lost everything. Their description is that the ice house was giant and that the value of his loss was $5,000, which really is a significant investment at that time, which suggests that he had done very well in James or in Buffalo. These are uh, advertisements for his eyes, uh, 1866. Uh, later on, when he's working with Johnson, he's brought him on. And uh, his connection then to that nice business. So this is his death certificate. And he has very little mention in Jamestown history. I, I Very little interest mentioned about his uh, involvement in starting the ice industry here. Um, little little details about this man. It's likely because the, his ending probably wasn't very good. He, his uh, death certificate indicates that he died from alcoholism. And some of the way that his wife's obituary 20 years later suggested it had been a pro problematic end to his life. And likely because of that, and a very mm, uh, teetotaling Jamestown, histories, um, he's not given very much credit. He's, he's, he should be part of history. He's the reason why lots of things happen in Jamestown, uh, and, yet, and yet he's very little noted. Uh, so let's move on to some of those other early things. A.C. Holmes, this is perhaps explaining why uh, the early date of Jacobson was listed. A.C. Holmes, in his obituary, said that he was the first in the area. So we, I haven't found his records to be able to to indicate that or not. He married an American, and he did, uh, on, this is really unusual because blacksmiths did very well in our area. That was a, 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 a good ticket if you were a Swede, and it was a great ticket if you were a Dane. And that whole mastery was uh, made for success in our area during this time period. He, uh, had apprenticed with his father, and his father was in, uh, had been the uh, master for several of the other things that come and do very well in the industry. But for whatever reason, he wasn't that a blacksmith in our area, but he decided to become a, uh, a salesman and a, and a shop owner. Um, he served uh, during the Civil War, and uh, he's all, I'm sorry, he did not. 
his brother then came later, Nicholas uh, Holm. And Nicholas Holm uh, served in the Civil War. Uh, he had been captured uh, and had been in uh, the Libby prison, which is not a, doesn't have a great history in Richmond, Virginia. And then after the war, uh, graduated from Allegheny College, and he became a noted uh, Methodist minister in America. Uh, so A.C. Holm, he's also a connection to lots of other things that come later on. So his uh, mother is actually the, or his aunt is actually the mother of two of the other prominent things who arrived. And then his uncle uh, was the master for another one who arrived. And then, you know, it just, he has, it's also a small island, <laughs> born home. But they were masters that were well connected with those who came. Here's someone who isn't in that industry, but came at that same time. All these days are the same age, and you're talking about probably a uh, hundred men, all of the, about the same age in the town of, uh, in the village of Rum. So they were, it was not, they certainly knew each other in Bornholm, and, and for that reason came here. Tiedemann had actually apprenticed as a, a painter, and he continued to be a painter here in the United States, he also got a, a, a patent for a scrim system for, for renovating walls in uh, older buildings by being able to uh, put new finishes on them. And he married a, a dressmaker who was here, who had been here for a while, but who was German in background. Um, and uh, I thought just an interesting thing, he had done, uh, he was most known for doing uh, very fancy horse carriages but there was a note of thanks from uh, the African-American community of Jamestown who had gone to Cory to celebrate the passage of the 15th Amendment from there, how the, the sign that he had made was the best that showed up and they were very proud of that. Um, this Greenland Brothers is really the, the perhaps the, the, the archetypical uh, or the film version of uh, the Danish emigration at that time. Their destination was California and gold country. And so one of the brothers who came first really didn't have enough money. And so then he ended up in Jamestown. Uh, and then he had enough money to go to California. The other brothers met him there. They spent a few years working and then they came back to the area. It's actually not a, an unfamiliar story when it comes to young Swedish men as well. Uh, but in the Greenland uh, brothers' case, uh, they came back and they settled in the uh, Warren, uh, in the city of Warren, mostly. Um, they were first started in, and they for, uh, like others, they first started in working for others. They started their own uh, furniture industry from that. Nelson Greenland uh, started a uh, a uh, uh, furniture sales room in the center of uh, Warren that had a long, long history. Uh, I think he was probably 50 years in business there. Strangely enough, his he was also an undertaker. So in the same storefront, he was both selling furniture and being an undertaker. That's kind of unusual, I think, uh, and struck me. Um, uh, and so, also, the Greenland brothers are more like Swedish families in that after the war, the rest of the brothers and sisters came to the area and also settled in the foreign area. So now, the uh, talk about blacksmiths. Uh, the early, uh, there was some activity in Jamestown um, from the 1820s, 1830s of, of making axes, uh, edge tool, and uh, an edge tool is any a tool that has an edge, so axes are sort of part of that. And so uh, about the 1850s, a man named Jeffords, and, uh, a little bit before, had, had really been able to take an industry that was not very productive, not very efficient, and he had turned it around to being a, a, a profitable business. So the early Danes that arrived in Blacks, uh, with blacksmith apprenticeship worked in Jeffords' factories and did very well. Um, Nicholas uh, Romer uh, became the uh, head of the shop there. He ran things. Um, and 
the Romer family did very well first with Jeffords and then afterwards starting their own business very nicely. And uh, the credit here is to uh, uh, the interest in these families in Bornholm. Um, there's a website showing the, the part of the collection uh, of the Romer pictures that is in Bornholm. Evidently, one of the brothers had collected photographs and sent it to a cousin or a friend back in Bornholm. It went through down, and now that's part of the collection of the, the, uh, of the of one of the archives. Sorry, I'm not sure which which it is that's in Bornholm. Uh, Nicholas, uh, as I mentioned earlier, had married the younger daughter, uh, the younger sister, and so he was tied in with Jacobson and, uh, in Jamestown. And uh, very pretty woman, I think. Uh, the uh, so this same showing you again the same connection through families uh, uh, for Methodists. <laughs> uh, this is the family that uh, Jacob Reese is staying with when he comes to America. So they live, uh, the Jeffords um, factory is likely uh, off the Chattuck line, um, really in the center of Baltimore, uh, what at that point was uh, Dexterville, uh, what was called Dexterville. And living with them also would have been uh, John Romer, who was uh, uh, Nicholas's younger brother. Piece of nice shot. And uh, after, in, in the 1870s, uh, Nicholas Romer left uh, the industry, went to Buffalo, set up uh, industry, uh, an axe industry, bought the equipment for a company in Buffalo. From that experience, uh, he then started with his brother, the Romer Brothers Axe Factory. First it was in Gwanda, and then it was in uh, uh, Dunkirk, and it, they did very well in that industry. Uh, this is it inside of the factory? Pictures. And another note of the, the way that they were producing axes. And a picture of the, their family enjoying the shore of Lake Erie. Uh, Now I want to switch over to Jacob Reese, who, uh, and I'll talk about why he's important first, but um, his chapter where he's talking about Jamestown is titled uh, Working and Wandering. Um, so I'll just briefly go, sorry, uh, through his itinerary. He's uh, from a middle class family in Denmark, certainly not a poor family. Um, he arrives in New York, uh, sort of footloose and fancy free. He goes first and works, uh, here's his work in a, a factory, so he, along the Allegheny River. So he goes from New York City all the way out there and then encounters all these other immigrants from all these other different countries and has all of these experiences. And he goes back to New York City, uh, has a rough time there, this or that. Finally, makes his way down to Philadelphia. And there he's taken in by a Danish consul. Um, and for whatever connection, uh, the, which I haven't been able to trace, the Philadelphia uh, consul knew of some of the Danish community in Jamestown and had some personal connection with one of the Danes who was living in Jamestown at the time. I don't know who that was. And so he said, uh, so after two weeks of, of freeloading in Philadelphia and, and gaining, I, I don't think he was well at the time, regaining his composure, he set off and came to Jamestown. So in Jamestown, he did everything. He, he was cutting trees on Swedes Hill. So he was probably working for a Swede, cutting the land to be able to uh, build houses. He was working on the steamboats on the lake. He was ice harvesting, making candles, I think. Uh, he talks very fondly about trapping uh, muskrat. Um, and he also wrote letters to the editors, which are likely the first journalism that he practiced in, in America. And uh, he also uh, uh, tried to make money lecturing, which he was successful at for a while. And then, uh, uh, 
and then fell out of favor. Um, after being in Jamestown, he was at Dr. Spencer's in Westfield, from there to Buffalo, where he worked in the shipyard, had those sorts of things, and he was a traveling salesman, and dealt with everything. He was connected with the Danish business, the furniture business that went bankrupt uh, in Warren County. Um, finally, in New York City, he started a journalism career, and uh, that's how he's well known. But he's, he's had lots of experiences before he uh, settles in in journalism. So he lived in Jamestown in the winter of 1878-71, and he was in the Romer family then. You say in Jamestown, it's really Faulkner where they live, but he worked in the Jamestown area. His uh, most important book, likely, is How the Other Half Lives, published in 1890, very influential on progressive. And it's because it was uh, one of the first uses of photography in journalism to really uh, create change. And the book is quite noteworthy in, in both the, the uh, technical details of how illustrations and photographs were printed, but also uh, the impact of the images in telling the story. So these are all Jacob Reese photographs. The Library of Congress has uh, just recently had an exhibition about it. So he's still current, and actually, he's better known now as for his photography than he is for his journalism. Uh, some of the images are just great, really amazing. Uh, he wrote a biography of Theodore Roosevelt, and uh, Roosevelt uh, said, you know, like one of the most useful citizens in America. He was a big deal at the time of his time period. Um, and it just happened to spend a little while in Jamestown. It's because he spent a while in Jamestown that people, and also because of our connection, but especially because of Reese. That's why historians in Denmark, in particular those who are interested in Bornholm history, have researched the Danes here in Jamestown. So Henning Bender uh, has written a really good book that was in their local uh, historical magazine. Um, and that's the connection to that. And also, Anna Vivica Knudsen, she's the one who posted the pictures that are from that album, which I find really spectacular. For whatever connection, there's also, I mentioned there were a couple of Danes who I haven't been able to track. Uh, one of them is Hans Anker. It may be, I don't know what the connection is, uh, many Danes became early photographers. So one of the Greenland brothers had a photography shop in Warren, and then became a partner in Globe Studios and, and, and had continued that for many years. So you'll find many old photographs with his name on it. And Hans Acker, I, I can't, have not been able to track, but he may be John Anker, who is in Ohio as a photographer later on. I don't know why there's a connection, I don't know why there's an interest, but there seem to be a, a, a lot of Danes who end up as photographers. Bornholm is shown in this map. Um, I, just in terms of size, <coughs> the island of Bornholm is approximate, so the distance between Rena and the other side of the coast is about half the width of Chautauqua County. And from here to here is about the length of Chautauqua Lake. So it's not a very large place, but as far as uh, Jamestown goes, it's, it's, it's Denmark, right? So any questions? I'll leave it. Yeah. I was going to say, um, I read part of that, how the other half lives. Mm -hmm. Was that around the same time as um, the book about the meat factories? Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's all part of the progressive movement, all saying, you know, these are things that are happening in America mm -hmm. that aren't right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so very much, and eventually what uh, Roosevelt's platform reforms. Mm -hmm. So, yes, mm -hmm. all the same time. And the influence of, he's not the only journalist working in, and, and he's not the only one you, who starts to bring in photography, mm -hmm. but he's one of the first, and because of his success, other people start bringing it in, so photography jumps out as a, as a way of social, as a means towards social end, uh, a social change that did not happen. Any other questions? Great. 
Well, I'll post the, I'll make a, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm talking about ice harvesting. Yes. So my great grandfather was an ice harvester at Point Chautauqua. Did mm -hmm. you ever run into the about Point Chautauqua? Uh, I know that there's a man in, uh, sorry that I forget his name, <coughs> Venus Point, who's written the history of the ice industry. Oh. And, and evidently there were industries all along the lake. Mm -hmm. I think he concentrates greatly on the Mayville area. Oh, cool. But uh, so he, that book may contain lots of the information on that. Yeah. Um, but certainly down in the the the, uh, the lower half of the lake, this would have been a, a very large op operation. I think, if I, I, as I recall, it was twelve thousand tons that he lost in that first flood. So he had only been open for business one year. Twelve thousand tons is a, uh, a little more than three and a half story building by. Uh, 40 feet deep by 100 feet long or something. It's a lot of ice. <laughs> it's, it, I'm, I'm, my math date may be wrong on that. I don't recall what it was, but I was trying to think how much. I, it was a large, so when they say that it was a big operation, it was a big operation. And so he then sells, he brings in a man named Johnson. So welcome to, welcome to James, who's a Dane. And then they sell to things who are named Johnson who go into partnership with other Johnsons or something. It's, so it's complicated, but uh, Beck is involved with it until 1872, I think, with the ice industry. Also, did you know there was an impersonator of Hot Christian Anderson here on four or five years no. ago? Yeah, did anyone else see it? Dan Danes are very, uh, I spent a year in Denmark, uh, a little bit less than a year. <laughs> Danes are rightly very proud of their heritage. Uh, they had great, for the size of the country, they had what they believe is a great impact on the world, which mm -hmm. it is. I'll agree with them. I'm very proud of them. And so, yeah, certainly uh, it's it's almost like we don't even think, and that's they wince at that sometimes, that, he, that he's Danish, right? And we lose the fact that he's so important, but no, mm -hmm. that, hey, he came from, <laughs> he came from. Food, I think. I mean, so it, they're very rightly proud. And likewise, it's the same feeling that they have towards Jacob Reese. Here's somebody who changed the world. Hey, but he was Danish. Mm -hmm. He changed the world. I, I never know that he was Danish, but it was interesting. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Like I said, I'll, I'll put these slides together. Uh, well, I'll just download it in the other form, and then I'll post them to my website, jamestown.sweets.org. So if you want to take a look at the images, or, uh, they'll be available there. Right. So we'll be buying that guy's picture. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.